if you have your Bibles with you, if you'll be finding Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. Brother Dickey, I'm pretty sure when you get there, you'll not have my name by that verse. But uh, if you do, you let me know. Because I'm not saying I can't forget, because I may not know where I parked, but <laughs> I don't remember ever being here before. Isaiah chapter 45. We're going to kind of pick up. We touched on something this morning, and I didn't want to get too deep into it because I knew tonight we were going to get more into it. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. I'm going to uh, preface it by saying it's not easy to do what we're talking about tonight. But if we can get to where we can, folks, I'm going to tell you something. We would have a blessed life. Uh, you know, and like Sister Amy was talking about the stress and the anxiety, I I've never in my life seen people more stressed out uh and you know and and this world is just i mean they don't know why i know why but they haven't figured it out yet if you live in this world you know without god i can't imagine <clears throat> the level of the stress those people have you know a child of god has stress too i mean i'm not saying we're we're free of that but just imagine living in this world with no hope. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people whose only hope in this world is the government. Pray for them because they've got no hope. But all this struggles, and a lot of it can come back to one thing. And if we will realize this tonight, and I'm going to take you into Scripture, and I'm going to show you why it's unnecessary, why we don't have to do it, but, you know, I listened to the Sunday school lesson this morning talking about, you know, Moses leading the children out of uh, Egypt. You know, shortly thereafter that, they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years because they're hard-headed. Your pastor's hard-headed. I hate to tell you that. Michael Joe popped up like, you can go ahead and amen, Michael Joe. It's all right. You've known me a long time. Uh I was laughing the other day when I was 12 years old. We went here for a short time to church here, and me and Michael Joe got to hang out a lot back then. And I found a picture not too long ago, Michael Joe, and I don't look any uh, older, but, boy, you've aged. But uh, We was 12, so that's, what, 20 years ago? Yeah, so math wasn't my good thing either. But what I want to tell you tonight, and I want to show you in Scripture, because God laid this on my heart, and... It will benefit you. It'll benefit your family. It'll benefit everything about your life if you will just apply this, what I'm going to tell you tonight. Now, and there's a word that I want to define. It is control. The power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. Folks, the government, our homes, the schools, this world, there are all people trying to fight to gain control. What they don't realize is they can never gain control. Even if your candidate wins the election, you haven't gained control. Folks, God is still in control. Now, I was glad Brother Junior brought that up about the hurricane because like I told you this morning, one thing I know for sure, <clears throat> I don't know that God sent that hurricane. I, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume to ever say that. But one thing I know, he gave it permission. He allowed it. He, nothing happens without God's permission. And, folks, I'm going to tell you something. And, and I'm not, I don't want to get political with this. I, I'm, I'm wanting to take something off of you tonight. But. I've told you, I've quit watching the news. I do not watch the news anymore. There is no use in it. All it is is lies. So I, if I can quit, if I can quit the videos where they stir me up, I might could stop my blood pressure medicine. But I still, I still get fired up. But, but I want to tell you something. I know most people 
in this room believe the same way I do, that if the election goes one way, we're in a lot of trouble. Life as we know it will probably be over. Christianity will be full-fledged under attack. But I want to tell you something tonight. If that happens, if that happens, let me tell you something. God gave permission. And let me tell you why that would happen. Have you ever read about Nineveh? Have you ever read about God's children when they drift away? What does God do to them? He punishes them. Folks, I'm going to be honest with you. We deserve it. <clears throat> I'm not saying, well, yeah, I will. <laughs> Even us here at Kegelsville, are we as on fire for God as we should be? Folks, if we were, if, if the church was as on fire for God as it should be, this would have never happened in our nation. We would have never been at this possibility of total socialism and Marxism in our country. Total destruction. But I'm going to tell you something. Tonight, I want to take that worry away from you. Don't worry. Now, I'm not telling you, you do your part, you, you vote. Folks, people in this country bled and died for us to have that right. And if you don't do it, it is a disgrace. But all you can do is two things. Vote and pray. Amen? Amen. I know it's easy to sit around and say, oh, if this happens, oh, you know, guess what? If it happens, we need it. We need it to bring us back to where we are serving God. We're seeking God. And let's just be honest. We deserve the judgment. This country has abandoned God, turned their back on God. I could totally see where he would, he, he would judge us and he, and he would discipline us. But they're fighting for control. God is in control. And I want to read to you, if you, if you found Isaiah chapter 45, if you would stand tonight to honor the reading of God's word, I'm going to start in verse number 5. Isaiah 45 and 5. Again, Isaiah chapter 45, and I'm going to start in verse number 5. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this opportunity to be in your house. God, we just thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. And, Lord, thank you for your patience with us, God. Lord, tonight we thank you for the songs that have been sung and the wonderful testimonies praising your name. God, we thank you. And we also admit, God, if we gave you the true praise that we should, we would be here for the rest of our lives praising your name and thanking you for what you've done for us. God, now it comes to preaching of your word. And, Lord, not only do I ask you, God, to forgive me of my sins, Lord, and wash me clean. But Holy Spirit, God, I pray you rise up in me and take me out of the way tonight, God. Use this vessel to speak your words through in a powerful and clear way. Lord, convict our hearts. Sink them into our hearts and our minds. Show us, Lord, the way that you want us to go and take us by the hand and lead us and help us be what you've called us to be so we can lead the lost to you. And in Jesus' precious holy name, his church prayed. Amen. I bet you've never... You, you may have read over this before, but look what it says in verse 7. This is God. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. Do you remember when you studied when Moses and Aaron was going in front of Pharaoh and they, you know, they performed the miracles and Pharaoh, he, remember it said God hardened his heart. God uses people to further his kingdom. God uses people to make sure his will is done. That's why I say, folks, don't panic if this doesn't go the way that we think it should. Just realize we are being chastised by God and pray that we learn what we should learn to turn this thing back around. 
Because God is in control. God is in control of everybody. And he, everything that happens, like I said this morning, has to have the permission of God. You remember when the disciples were on the ship with Jesus and he was asleep in the, in the bottom of the boat. And they came and they woke him up. And they said, do you not care that we perish? And he stepped out. And if you remember what he did, he spoke to the wind and the waves. And they laid down. That wind quit blowing and the waves quit fighting. Folks, if he's got that kind of control, what are we worried about today? What I, what I want us to be today is like the people of Nineveh. When Jonah went to them, what did they do? They heard the word of God. They knew they had messed up and they repented. Folks, if we would repent, God would spare us. I'm interested to see if we repent or if we turn. And I'll be able to tell you here in just a few weeks what it's going to be. But you see, we must Realize, no matter who is the president, no matter who the king is, no matter who your boss is, God is in ultimate control. And folks, I've seen him do things with people that I would have never believed. You know, I said, that person will never do that. You know, that's, and God melts that heart some way, and all of a sudden you see a new... Folks, God can do whatever God wants to do. But what we must realize tonight is his will is going to be done. I'm going to say that again. God's will is going to be done. We can either allow him to do it through us, or he'll move us and use another. Amen? God wants his word preached here in this church. I can either give in to that and let him preach it through me, or I can be stubborn and, folks, he will move me. I promise, I don't want on that side of God, amen? And you don't want on that side of God. Whatever God calls us to do tonight, it is his will that we do it. Friend, get on board. Don't fight God. Don't resist God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who's him, God, who worketh all things, after the counsel of his own will. God's will from the very beginning was that we would worship him and live for him. You know, I don't know how much you've been following this in Israel lately. Folks, don't worry about America. Watch Israel. If you, if, if you want to know if the rapture or something like that's close, Folks, it's not centered on America. It's centered on his chosen ones, which is Israel. And folks, I'm telling you, the world is attacking Israel. And us, its strongest ally, we're cowering down and backing away. Folks, it is clear if we do that, we will be destroyed. God's will, God will protect his children. He will protect his chosen. And, you know, I, I, I heard some people under that, and I just want to reach through the, the screen and strangle them. You know, they don't understand. They said, why is Israel God's chosen and the Arabs not? I said, well, you've got to go back to the beginning. You've got to go back to Isaac and Ishmael. They were never intended, you see, because Abraham and Sarah, because Abraham stepped out and got out of God's will, that's why Ishmael come to present. That was not the chosen ones. That was man's fault. That's because we didn't wait on God. And folks, I'm here to tell you tonight, when you step out of his will, when you get away from him, you can become an Ishmael. You can be never intended. But folks, he had a promise to Abraham. And even though Abraham didn't wait on him like he should, he had come to fruition and he had Isaac. And folks, he was the chosen one. And that is the seed and the stem of Israel. And folks, that will never be destroyed. And Netanyahu said the other day, and folks, I just almost... It made, this has been several months ago, but he was talking to reporters, and he said, you got to understand, you got to look at our history. He said the Roman government was a mighty, mighty government, much bigger than Israel. He said, they're gone now, and Israel still stands. Folks, Israel is going to be here till God takes them home. Is his will will be done, and we either get in line or we get moved. But you see... What I want to share with you tonight, it's not political. It's not worldly. 
This is what God put in my heart because I believe with everything in me tonight, he wants you to take it home with you. He wants you to take this into your everyday life. He wants us to let go of our worry, let go of our fear, let go of our doubt about the future. We cannot control any part of it. We cannot control any person except ourselves. I'll amen since you don't. Amen. Because, folks, let's just be honest. I'll be honest. When I worry about stuff, when I find myself, whether it's, I don't care what it is, whether it's health, finances, anything you can come up with, I think you'll agree with me, we worry about stuff we can do nothing about. Nothing. Think about how peaceful our life would be if we realized God's in control He's got it. Don't worry. Folks, I, I want you to take this tonight. I want you to change your life. I don't want you to get up in the morning dreading life. I don't want you fearing things. God loves you. Now, let me back up a second. If you're under the sound of my voice or you're listening on YouTube and somewhere else and you're not a child of God, friend, I hope you have no peace. I hope you are scared to death. And I, don't, and I mean that because I love you. Because if you leave this world without Jesus Christ being your Lord and Savior, friend, you are going to a place that was never intended for you. It was made for the devil and his demons and folks, but that's where we go if we do not accept Jesus Christ. And that is something to worry about. But tonight, if you are a born-again child of God, Folks, I, I tell you this all the time. Really, the only worry we should have is praying for lost people. Not, we learned this morning, we don't have to worry, worry about what to eat, what to wear. God will provide. God will give us what we need. Notice I said need. A lot of people try to turn that into God will give you what you want. God only gives you what you want as we learned this morning, when the desire of your heart is him. When he's the desire of your heart, you bet you. You can ask anything and he'll give it to you. But you know what? When he's the desire of your heart, it changes what you ask for. Gone are the Cadillacs and the Ford Raptors. and the, Then you're concerned about other people. You're like, God, open doors for me to share the gospel. Or, or God, my brother over here is, is hurting so bad. Please bless their family. That marriage is in trouble and those little kids, bless them, God. They need help. Or my brother over here, he's addicted to alcohol or drugs. God, he needs a touch from you. We need to be brokenhearted for other people. Plain and simple. But to everyday worries, your finances, your, <clears throat> I don't care if, if, you, if you get a bad report from the doctor. Don't worry. God's in control. I talked to a gentleman not long ago, and he said, well, I ain't got many years left. And I said, I, I, I know how many years you got left. He kind of looked at me. He thought I was going to prophesy to him. I said, you got as many years left as God wants you to have. You will be here till God says it's time to go home. And then, friends, I don't care who you are, you're going home. I don't want to be here a second longer, and I don't want to leave here a second before. And, yes, there's things I want to see on this earth. I want to see you know, I want to see my grandkids. I want, I, there's things in this earth that I do enjoy. But I know this. If I don't get to, if he calls me home before January, I still get to see them for eternity. As long as they grow up and serve Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Folks, 98% of the people I talk to, they're worried. They're scared. They're doubtful. Folks, God did not give us the spirit of fear. But we've got to hang on to that. Let's, it, let's just be honest tonight. We've all still got flesh in us, amen? We've all still got some flesh in us, and, and sometimes, and folks, I, I'm picking on me tonight. I'm going to give Ken a break. I see it in me more than I see it in anybody else because I know me better than I know any of you. 
when something comes up, it is so easy for me to let that flesh rise up and me start to trying to figure it out in my own mind or trying to solve the problem myself, you know, and God is just sitting there waiting, saying, son, would you please stop fighting and stand still, worship me, and let me handle that for you. And folks, when I do that, he never fails me, ever. But you see, we've got to let go of this we, and, and realize that this is the, if I, if I don't get anything else to you to not get this, there is nothing we can control in this life but our walk with Christ. Period. And men, I'm gonna talk. I'm gonna talk to us here in a minute. And I'm gonna. Ladies ain't getting off the hook. But I know it's harder for us. We're taught. The Bible even says we're to be the providers of our home. So we're we're the ones that goes out, works. We go out, we protect. That that's what we're supposed to do. But let me tell you something. I thank God that He gave me the health and the protection and the ability to work my full time so I could retire. I owe that 125% to God. If you're still working, you need to hit your knees and thank God that he's given you the health to do it. Because I've seen some very broken hearted men. I'll never forget this as long as I live. There was a man out the hospital and they brought him in and he was from Dover and he, he was a logger. And folks, when I say he'd landed a tree on him, he'd landed a big one on him. And he'd laid there all day long, over eight hours before anybody found him. He'd actually took his finger in the dirt and wrote a goodbye letter to his wife and kids. He thought he was gonna lay there and die. So when he come in, big burly man, and I heard him, and they were in there telling him, you know, basically you've got gangrene and, and you're gonna lose a leg and a hip. And he said, how am I going to log with only one leg. And they said, sir, you're not gonna be able to log. You'll be disabled. He cried like a baby for 20 minutes. He's like, what am I gonna do? So folks, if you have two legs or you have two arms and you can go to work, you better be praising God because you're just one accident away, one thing away. Or maybe it's your lungs. Maybe it's diabetes. Maybe it's cancer. Folks, I've seen more cancer just in our church than in years. I mean, probably forever since we've been here. Thank God for your health. Thank God for your blessings. Thank God for it all because he's in control. And the reason, you know why Ken's been through? I pick on him a lot, so now I'm going to brag on him. You know why Ken's lost both his legs and now he's battling cancer and he still comes in and he still leads singing and he still leads the service in the morning and he still praises God? Because he knows God is in control. And he knows that Ken Stanick will be here as long as God wants Ken Stanick here. And then when Ken Stanick's ready to go home, God will take him home when God's ready. Folks, he knows he's in control. Think about that. If we just realize... We're fighting a battle for no reason. We're worrying. We're getting sick. We're fighting for no reason. We can't help it. We can't do nothing about it. I've told you this story before, but one of the hardest things I ever had to do was when my girls went to college. And folks, they just went 20 miles down the road. But I realized, not being under my roof, what had I lost? Control. I didn't have control. My wife had to finally tell me, hey, you got to give it to God. They belong to him. He's in control. And, folks, that's the only way I was able to get my sanity and to quit worrying. I put them in God's hands and said, God, take care of them. Because, folks, I, I, I've told you this before. If I was in control, I'd already blowed this thing up. I said, America, that's pitiful. We're electing men who wear dresses to government offices. Boom, I'd have blowed us smooth up. But God is patient, God is loving, and God does not want anybody to perish. He wants all to be repentant and come to heaven. But you see, why 
God even tells us, and I'm going to, I read up to verse 33 this morning in Matthew. Now I'm going to read you the last verse in chapter 6. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. A couple things I want to point out there. As long as we're down here, there's going to be evil. There's going to be bad things that happen. And I've told you this all the time, but even good, God-loving Christian people have flat tires. And I learned tonight, even, even good Christian, God-fearing men have their trucks stolen in New Orleans. It happens. Folks, just because we're Christian, don't shield us from all the bad things that can happen. What it shields us from is the worry, the doubt, and the fear, because we know that God, if, if, if you truly love God, then you ought to take Romans 8, 28 and tattoo it in your brain, because he works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That means if, you, if they steal your truck, it's going to work out for good, for your good. Folks, in the end, you may not see it in the beginning, but think about it. If we truly believe that, would we worry about anything? Absolutely not, because we would look at every situation and go, that's going to work out for my benefit. God knows what he's doing. So what do we do? We pray, we read, and we fight today. Don't worry about tomorrow. And I realize what I'm telling you is hard to do. But tomorrow will handle tomorrow when it comes. I used to work with a couple guys, and Michael Joe would know them, and they were older than me. And when nobody else was around and I had a deal, one day they wanted to go with me. <laughs> Worst day of my life. Because one of them had never bought dope, and the other one, okay, neither one of them probably had ever bought dope. And they went with me. And, you got, and Michael Joe knows what I'm talking about. And by this time, I'd been doing it. 21 years, 22 years, I think I'd got the knack of it. I heard the words, what if, more that day. And I finally said, look, you old geezers. I said, quit what if in me. I said, all you can do is react. If it happens, we'll react. What if they find the wire? Then we're going in. Uh, we'll go in and get them. What if it? I said, shut up. You're driving me crazy. But think about it. We what if world... That's our problem. We're what ifers. What if this happens? What if that happens? Guess what? If it happens, God's still in control. And we can't do anything about it. So quit worrying. I believe it is, I said earlier, I was going, I believe it is definitely harder for us men to relinquish control to God. One of the hardest things it is for us is to relinquish control of the steering wheel. Amen? Any ameners in here? Any men in here think you're the best driver in the house? Amen. Okay. <laughs> Is it hard to ride in the passenger seat and let her drive? Amen. Matter of fact, let's just be honest. Is it hard to ride in the seat and let anybody else drive? Very few. All right, all right. You stepped out on that limb. How many people would you like to sit in the passenger seat and then be in a pursuit about 130 mile an hour? Very uncomfortable feeling, would you admit? There you go. And it's an uneasy feeling because you're not in control. Better hear me tonight. You're not in control. May I tell you something? You're not in control of anything. I don't care how good a driver you are. You ain't control of that other guy coming at you that's a poor driver. I'm not mentioning DWI tonight, Miss Joyce. I'm not even saying that. She did not get a DWI for the record. I'm just teasing. But can anybody in here control the other driver, the other lane? Anybody ever seen people that can't drive? Mm-hmm. You know, I t we hadn't been here very long, and uh, God had showed me every time you hit the rumble step on the road, praise God for something. And I'd mentioned that in church, and the next week, you wouldn't believe how many people had been thanking God. That tells me people having a little trouble drifting to the right. <laughs> but you're not in control. Let me tell you, folks, 
The only thing, again, that you can control is your walk with God. That's it. But you see, the reason I think we, us men have so much trouble is we don't truly understand our role. And before I want to just bash us, I will say God has ways of showing me that women struggle with this too. And you can, uh, you can ask my wife, if you want to have trouble, let an office full of women work together. Amen? Thank you. Uh, men's no better. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not patting one on the back, not the other one. But it's a struggle when you want to be in control or you get too many people wanting to be in control. This is what I've witnessed. Too many people wanting to be a chief and nobody wants to be an Indian. Uh, and Lord, I know they'll call me racist for saying that, but I'm sorry. That's just the best illustration I have. But listen, men, this is where I think we struggle. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. It is clear we have been given responsibility. We've, I'm not going to say authority because Christ has the authority. We have the responsibility to obey Christ. We have responsibility to be the lead in our house to obey Christ. I don't think we understand that role, and I think that's why we struggle to give up control because somewhere along the line we've taken verses like this out of Scripture, out of context, to make it, make it look like we are in control of the home. Let me say this. You are responsible for the home. You are responsible for what your children are taught. You are responsible for what goes into your house, what goes out of your house. And yes, like, like you know, I'm not worried about Sister Joyce's grandchildren one bit. I know they got godly instruction. But folks, not every child has godly instruction. Not every child is blessed to live in a home where Jesus Christ is taught and preached. But folks, let me tell you something. It is the parent's responsibility. It is the father of the home's responsibility that their children be raised godly. If they are not raised godly, it falls squarely on his shoulders because it says right here, the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man. Folks, don't re men, don't rejoice what that says. You better be fearful for what that says. It puts a responsibility in your life not to be the king, as I said this morning, not to sit in your recliner and flip the TV and expect her to bring you food. And that's not what it's saying. Folks, what it's saying is your heart better be broken for your family. Your heart better be broken for others. You better be in there reading. You better be in there praying. You better be calling out their name to God because it is your responsibility. You will answer for it. That's why all these, we live where a government actually, they celebrate the man not being in the home. They, they will reward people financially for, for families having child, child after child after child and no father there to lead them. Folks, it's not the government's job. It needs to be the church. We need to get in there and tell them about Jesus Christ and tell these men, you need to be, you're not a baby daddy. You need to be a father. You need to be somebody who reads the word of God. You need to be leading your children. And folks, I don't, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but this latest school shooter, they're arresting mom and dad. Praise God. Praise God. Because if I've got a 14-year-old boy and he's got a gun at school, it is my responsibility, number one, to make sure he knows how to use a gun, and number two, that he has respect for the gun, and number three, that he's not going to school with it and shooting other people. The buck stops here, men. You can raise your hand. It stops with us. It is our responsibility. And God has laid it out very clear. So how should the man lead? We should lead by being the first to surrender and cry out for help from Jesus. Some of you may have been in this situation before. I pray not. But folks, it's all I've seen for the last 26 years of my career was families would come to me and their children was hooked on drugs and they didn't know where to turn. 
And folks, I don't care who you are. You sit there and you listen to them, and then you just put yourself in their position. How would you feel if your little girl was out in that world with a needle in her arm, with God knows who, doing God knows what? Or your son out running the streets, hotel to hotel, slinging a bag of dope here, a bag of dope there. And he's going to go to the penitentiary. It's going to happen sooner or later. And then they go down there, and folks, there's, that's not rehab. They just get worse. Because they're, uh, uh, I can tell you from experience, rehab without Jesus is useless. Because not only, I mean, you've got to change your world. You can't run with the same crowd. You can't, do, you can't go to the same places. And, folks, there's only one way you break those chains, and that's give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ. And that's why, Brother Marcus, that's why I call him. That's why very few people I turn this pulpit over to. That's why I let him preach here because I've, I've, I've been in the battles with him. I've seen he's broke the chains of addiction. God broke his chains. And he, he, he inspired me so much because all I'd ever seen was failure after failure after failure. And I said, Brother, you don't know how much you mean to me, how much your walk means to me because you are living proof that methamphetamine can be defeated by Jesus Christ. Folks, anything can be defeated by Jesus Christ if we'll allow him to do it. But you see, men, as soon as we learn that God is in control and we, and we no longer have to fear or doubt, then we can become stable and strong. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How many people do you say see today in our world with a sound mind? Now, folks, I'm just going to leave that alone. We, we invent a lot of our own problems. And we want to label stuff and medicate it. We want to medicate the problems out of this world. It's like a pain doctor. A pain doctor just gives you pills to make the pain go away. What does it do to fix your problem? Absolutely nothing. He masks the symptoms. Folks, let me tell you something. Pain is useful. Pain lets you know something's wrong. If you didn't have pain, I know this is kind of grotesque and but it's after lunch and I don't mean to mess your supper up but you you know lepers will lose feeling in their hands and in their extremities and in those old hospitals where they would put the lepers they'd have to watch because the rats and stuff would come and eat their fingers and their toes and they'd never know it they didn't know this was going on because they had no pain. They felt no pain. Folks, let me tell you something. We live in a society today that's doped up, drunk up. They feel no pain, so they know nothing's wrong. But when they sober up, they can feel a pain in their heart, and they know something's wrong. You know what they're looking for? They're looking for Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that can save them. But what do they do? They go back to the crutch that they've leaned on for years, and it's in a bottle, or it's in a pill, or it's in a sex, it's in a relationship, it's in control of something Folks, I'm telling you tonight, God is wanting to break chains in lives. Man, and so many people out there today are suffering and hurting. And we're sitting here in Cagelsville, Arkansas, with the answer. And we need to take that answer outside these doors. We need to take the answer to the prisons. We need to take it to the streets. We need to go see the people who've got the needle hanging in their arm. Because, folks, I'm going to tell you something. They're people just like me and you. They've got families like me and you. I've known them personally. And, folks, I've seen one that I dealt with her for years. I arrested her four or five times. It came to the point where she wouldn't quit selling dope. And finally, I walked up. We had buys on her. And I saw her and her kids at a restaurant. And I just walked up and had her hop over into the passenger seat of her own car. And I got in her car and I drove her to my office. And I said, you know why I'm here? And she said, yeah, I know why you're here. And I said, why don't you stop? And she's got her kids in the back. And I'm trying to whisper to her. I said, what kind of future are you, are you giving them? 
And so when we went to the office, I had to interview her. So I took her to the back and I had the secretary entertain the kids up front. And the little girl, God bless her, was about eight years old. And she said, do you mind if I type something on your computer? And she said, no, honey, go ahead. And it took me about 20 or 30 minutes to talk to the lady. And all that little girl done. Now, folks, she's seven or eight years old. All she done was sat there and wrote, I, I typed out, I love you, I love you, over, over, and over. And she said, what are you doing, honey? She said, well, I know Mama's going to jail for a long time, so I want her to know I love her. Folks, that crushes your heart. They're people. They've just made decisions. That's not good. Anybody else in there ever made a bad decision? I sure have. I've made decisions I wished I could take back. But... With God, we get a fresh start. With God, he wipes us clean. Folks, he can break the chains of addiction, but we've got to allow him. We've got to take control out of our hands. You see, if we've got control, we'll grab a crutch that we're used to grabbing. For some, it's drugs, alcohol. For others, it can, it can be anything. But folks, a crutch like those will break and will fall. Jesus Christ will never fall. I'll close with this. Why can we live worry, fear, and doubt free if we choose? Why can we live that way? Because we learned God is in control. And now I want to close with this. If we admit he's in control, what does he think about us? You know he died on a cross for you. That tells you enough. But listen to very, very familiar scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward to you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. For those of you that are here tonight that have kids, I want you to think back to the first time you held them. Now, everybody told me, like the first time you hold them was this magical experience. It wasn't that way with me. Because the first time I held them, I was in the hospital, and I was still, I was, with, I was with her. And so a lot of my concern was about her, making sure she is okay. When I had that magical experience is after we got home, and the first time I got to sit in a rocking chair in there and feed them, that's when it hit me. And I thought, how can anybody not love a child? How can anybody mistreat a child? I don't, I don't understand it. And I praise God that I can't understand it. But for years, it brought an anger in me. I just believe there's a special place for people who hurt children. But I pray that they would find God because I know he loves them and I know he'd forgive them. But then you sit there. And while they're little, you do have some control. That's the most important time in our lives is what you instill in them while you have control. And I've had people look at me funny about this, and, but I believe this with my whole heart. The worst thing any parent could ever do to their child is to take them, on church, to, take them to church on Sunday and then live like hell Monday through Saturday. Because what are you showing them? You're showing them God is only a one day a week God. He's not real. It's just a, something we need to do. Folks, we, and, and this is somewhere where we have control. I tell people all the time, when we mess up and we do, when I mess up and I do things wrong, I can't say the devil made me do it. The devil has never made me do anything. I made every decision in my life. I'm responsible for the bad decisions and the good decisions. Folks, we need to realize, control the things you can control. And what is that? That's your relationship with Christ. What you cannot control, pray about and let him have it. If we will do that tonight, church, every one of our lives will be revolutionized. Every one of our lives will be uplifted. We'll have peace and comfort like he meant for us to have. If you would, stand with me all over the building. I do want to make it clear to you tonight as you're standing 
this promise only comes to those who have made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. If you're here tonight, friend, and you're not saved or you hadn't given your heart to God, whatever you want to call it, if you're not living for God, you're not here by accident. It's not happenstance that you're here. It's a divine appointment. And what this is tonight is God knocking on your heart's door because I know you've heard the word and I know the Holy Spirit is dealing with you. So it's up to you tonight. It is your decision. Nobody can make you. Nobody will force you. God's not, God's not going to force you. He's offering to you. He's offering you life opposed to death. He's offering you salvation. He's offering you heaven instead of hell. If you want that tonight, if you're tired of the life you're living, if you're tired of being beaten down and held down by the chains of addiction or the chains of Satan, folks, tonight, I'm telling you, my friend breaks chains. My Savior breaks chains. My Savior changes lives. If tonight, if you want that, it's offered to you tonight. The Bible says don't count on tomorrow. It says today is the day of salvation. One thing I can tell you tonight, friend, nobody under the sound of my voice is guaranteed to even wake up tomorrow. So if he's knocking on your heart, friend, I urge you, I'm telling you, you better open the door and let Jesus Christ in because it may be the last time you ever hear a knock. If you're here tonight and you need prayer for any reason, this altar's open. We'll pray with you. God wants to touch you. He don't want you worried tonight. He don't want you in doubt. He don't want you having fear. He wants you to trust him tonight. And I want you to trust him. I can tell you throughout my life, he showed me over and over and over again that we don't have to doubt him. We, as long as we'll serve him, 